This channel is part of the History Hits Network. Today I'm in Wrexham, North Wales, home to an extraordinary 18th century house with a difference. And I'm travelling there in style, in this private carriage pulled by this magnificent horse. We can do 20 miles a day, I'll have you know. I need to get there with all speed. Onwards, driver! Erddig is one of Britain's most fascinating stately homes. Designed by Thomas Webb in 1683, for almost 250 years, the York family called this grand country pile home. But today, I won't be going in by the main entrance, because in this grand house, the real interest and the exciting stories are below stairs. Where I'll be revealing the York's shockingly intimate relationship with their lowly staff. We're talking romance in this picture. With the help of hidden photos, private letters and secret diaries. The 9th of September, suddenly the bombshell explodes. I'll uncover astonishing stories of scandalous love. It would have been a sackable offence in those times, wouldn't been, it? It yes. And ruthless betrayal. This is a black mark on the family, isn't it? Absolutely. And out in the grounds, I explore the mysteries of an amazing wall of water. It's like the lost world. Whoa! Also at Erdig, Angelica Bell is punch drunk behind the scenes at the estate's orchards. Oh, not quite so much. <laughs> Nigel Havers goes sky high at Powys Castle for a new angle on Erdig's Georgian landscape gardener. This is amazing. Very really scary. Very scary. And Miriam O'Reilly's at Cork Abbey in Derbyshire. Gosh, this really is going back in time. Uncovering the terrifying tricks commonly used to keep domestic staff in check. And all you'd have is a candle. You might not have even had anything to light your way, just the light at the end of the tunnel. But to get the lowdown on the secrets of the servants' quarters here at Erdig, I'm meeting the National Trust's Graham Clark. It's very kind. The service around here is superb. Thank you very much. <laughs> Graham, hello. Hello, Alan. Welcome to Erdig. Lovely to see you. I don't think I've ever arrived in such style. It's wonderful. I know. We've taken you past the usual entrance for the York family yes. and brought you into the heart of the estate here, the working estate, right into the stable yard. The servants here were treated rather differently from normal, weren't they? That's right. They, were, they weren't treated as servants, they were treated as people. The Yorks really wanted to know a lot more about their staff, so they got to know them very well. And in the end, they actually commissioned portraits, photographs and wrote poems about them, so they knew them very well. How unusual is this in terms of, you know, boss-staff relationship? I think portraits have been done in the past, but actually in hand with the poems as well. As far as we know, that's unique. Can we go and have a look at them? We certainly can. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Enjoyed that. The tradition of having servants' portraits done started back in the 1700s, when the first Philip York ordered paintings of his staff. He would then write poems, packed with praise, and add them to the portraits. Later, the Yorks moved on from painting to photography, and pictures of their staff were proudly displayed in a below-stairs corridor. It's the closest you're likely to get to a servant's hall of fame. There are so many of them. This is like the National Gallery of British working life in a country house. Masses of them. That's right, and they were all put here by the family. But this is a great uh, photo. This is all the heads of department at Erdig here out on the front steps. So here you've got the, the butler. Drawing his cork. Drawing his cork. We've got children's slippers here, nursemaid. And here is the cook with her brace of fowl. At the oh, they look a fierce lot, don't they? Fierce brood. They are, aren't they? This <laughs> is a very early daguerreotype. And I think you had to... Uh, you had to keep a straight face for much longer in 1852 than you do now. Can you notice anything that's really different about the photo? Are they the family of the house or are they more servants that, in the window? The, that's the family. So what makes this really unique is the fact that the family have not only put themselves in the photo with their servants, but they've actually put themselves at the back. They're not the focus of this photo. That says a particularly special relationship, doesn't it? It does. And this poem all the way around it, verse after verse after verse after verse. 
So what we tend to see is a stanza really about each member in here. Yeah. And some of them are, are quite are quite poor poetry, but they're really charming, <laughs> cheesy but charming. Now this the last verse it says, that open window in between the squire and lady here are seen, together with their children twain, who did to present age attain these two small heads, now old and grey, yet dimly recollect the day, but after 60 years of space, how little does the memory trace. So that was written so many years after the rest of it was done. And the one next door is a later one. Well, this is 60 years later. So the date is now 1912. And look how technology has improved. We've now got a photograph. It almost leaps out at you now, doesn't it? It does seem very clear, doesn't it? Last verse here. At open window sits the squire in the same place where sat his sire. So that's his father. The little boy in that picture is now the master of the house in this one. Absolutely. You know, I look at this and it reminds me that on my father's side, he was a plumber, but his father and grandfather were gardeners. I'm a gardener, it's in the blood. And I, I look at the man down there and think a hundred years ago, that would probably have been me. Wonder if I'd have made head gardener. <laughs> Below stairs at Irving, you get a real feel for a life of service in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Like all servants, staff here would have spent long hours in the laundry, the bakehouse, the kitchen and the dairy. But if you look hard enough, you can spot telltale signs of that oddly open boss-staff relationship here. It's huge! It is, it's lovely, isn't it? Great size. It's a great kitchen. And what I particularly like about the room is that the windows are at ground level. With Astonishing windows. large window, lots of light coming in. That's right. I mean, it's, it's almost cathedral-like. Normally, servants were there to be not seen or heard. Mm. Uh, but here, they can look out. The other rooms in our servants' areas, they can all look across the courtyard to each other. Very, very different. But talking of work, I mean, working on an estate like this, whether you're indoors or out, was fiendishly hard. You really earned your keep, didn't you? You did. And it's easy to gloss over that when we, when we look back at history of Erdig. I mean, there was no real rest. The family was still entertaining. Being a servant at Erdig was no walk in the park, but at least they were chummy with their masters. It was so unusual back then that I can't help thinking there's more to it than meets the eye. Tell me a bit about the family. I mean, what was their wealth founded on? The Yorks really inherited their wealth from their great uncle John Mellor back in the 1710s and 20s. And although they were asset rich, you know, we're in a big house, they really had to keep their coffers topped up every generation or so, every other generation, with a, a wealthy marriage. But that really meant that they had to look after their money. And they weren't quite able to pay their servants the going rate for working down the road, so a, a butler here would be paid what an underbutler might be paid at the next estate. So this relationship they had with their servants was born out of necessity, really, because by being kinder to them, they could ensure their stay. It was a relationship of convenience, really. I think you're right, yes. The Yorks couldn't pay the going rate, so they had to treat them well. It paid to work for the Yorks, but not in that kind of way. Not literally. But it didn't stop there. Extraordinarily, this intimacy even extended to below-stairs romance. I'm back in the servants' corridor with the National Trust's Heather Vernon to get the gossip. So who have we got here, Heather? Lucy Hitchman, here in the beautiful blue dress. She was nanny, nursery nurse, to the two last squires. And that's these two boys here. Yes, you here. can see Simon um, and Philip here. And also Ernest Jones, who was a groomsman here at Erdig. This pair of po-faced Edwardians weren't just colleagues, they were also lovers. So, Heather, we're talking romance in this picture, which is telling us a story. It is. They would have met, as you can see in this um, picture, out for morning rides with the last squires, but also they would have seen each other around the house in this very corridor. So they probably walked up and down here. They're probably still where you and I are standing now. Absolutely, there. yeah, exchanging but... a little twinkle in the eye, perhaps. There seems to be a bit of a disparity in age. He looks an awful lot younger than I think it's the, the rosy red cheeks that have been <laughs> added to Ernest, but you are correct. Um, in this photo, Ernest would have been about 
uh, 23 and Lucy was 10 years his senior. Were there many instances of romances between servants at Erthig? We know of 18 in total. <laughs> so Bob, that's not the odd one, is it? No, and you have to remember that we weren't a very extensive house, so 18 is quite a lot. It would have been a sackable offence in most it houses, would wouldn't been, it? Yes. Because Lucy was really so important to the family, they really trusted her, she had their confidence. We know by reading some of the, the verse around this photo in 1911 that the family were aware that there was an attachment and a fondness. And they didn't disapprove? If you read the verse, there's, so nothing, there's nothing negative about it. So towards the end, it says, we trust the attachment here begun, may last while life its course shall run and love to us so freely shown be spent on children of their own. That's positive encouragement. Seems that way, doesn't it? And a private collection of Nanny Lucy's letters, lost for decades and still hidden from public view, gives further intimate details of what would have been a forbidden relationship in most households. The astonishing thing about Erthig is it is frozen in time. It is unchanged. Absolutely. This is something I really wanted to show you. It's Lucy Hitchman's postcard album. So she collected postcards, she was sent postcards. By friends, by relatives, and by her employers as well, Mr and Mrs York. Gosh, all these... Oh, look. Reading. <laughs> I've been to Reading. Some very glamorous places in here. <laughs> but this album itself was found in a second-hand bookshop. No. So we almost didn't have it here at Erthig. How remarkable. We have a really nice example here. Um, this is one that Ernest sent to Lucy. Dearest, this PC is, I think, rather a rare one. I thought it would do for your album for the winter nights. Weather rather showery and heavy, too. Nothing really changes. <laughs> it's Wales. <laughs> and then Ernest and Lucy. Yes. He's written his name and he's entwined, entwined it. That's with why her. I love oh, it. What a romantic <laughs> he was. Blatant courting among servants would have meant getting the sack in other stately homes, but the bosses at Erthig were actively interested in the romance between Nanny and Groom. There's um, another postcard as well. Um, Mrs York clearly knows that Ernest and Lucy have a correspondence and fondness, as she says, can you send me the news when you write to Miss Hitchman? This is an intriguing relationship, isn't it, between the master and mistress of the house and their servants. They've almost become like family to the Yorks. The romance between Lucy and Ernest came to an abrupt halt with the outbreak of World War I. Around six million men were mobilised, and Ernest was among the first to volunteer in 1914. But the couple remained wartime sweethearts and reunited when peace was declared. So, what happened? They married in 1919. They did move away from Erthig, but sometime later, they did come back. So, they lost them in the interim. But they came back. Yes, yeah, so they clearly still had a, a love for the place. Yeah. They were living on the estate. This postcard shows Mr and Mrs Jones at Erthig Park. Full circle. What a wonderful, wonderful story. All encapsulated in the album. Servants at Erthig may have had a better life than most, but all domestic staff endured horrible conditions in the 19th and early 20th centuries. They worked for up to 17 hours a day, earning next to nothing. They had no employment rights and lived with the constant threat of being sacked by a bad-tempered boss. Miriam O'Reilly is at Cork Abbey in Derbyshire discovering how the masters there made sure that servants were neither seen nor heard. I'm at the home of the Harper family, who for over 300 years had a very different relationship with their staff than the Yorks at Erthig. In fact, in the 1900s, when the lady of the house came through this beautiful green door with its distinctive clack when it closes, the gardeners would dash off out of sight through the garden wall here to give the family the privacy it craved. Hulk Abbey was owned by the Harper family from 1622 until the National Trust took it over in 1985. Rumour has it 
that the mere sight of some of the Harpers was enough to frighten their servants. So I'm itching to get behind the scenes to dig the dirt. I'm going to meet Eloise Brook. She's the head gardener here at Colcabbey to find out what her predecessors had to do to keep on the right side of this rather eccentric family. I'm also hoping to discover the well-kept secrets of this intriguing place. Hello, Miriam. Welcome to Cork Abbey Gardens. We learned from Alan at Erfig that the servants were very familiar with the family. Tell me about the Harper family. Um, well, they were here at Cork for over 300 years, and uh, really, I think they were a family, they felt they had everything they needed at Cork. Is that why they kept themselves to themselves? There certainly seems to be a thread of quite a sort of introverted streak in the family. Um, somebody once wrote down and said, wrote um, that it was a congenital unsociability. Where do you think this introversion in the family came from? It's hard to tell, but um, certainly the first real record of it is with the seventh baronet, who is sometimes called the isolated baronet. He certainly seemed to keep himself away from his equals in society, and he did seem to be deeply, deeply shy, to the extent that he'd perhaps communicate with servants in notes and uh, really didn't want the gardeners to see him when he was out in the garden, so he actually built a tunnel. It meant that the gardeners could, you know, access, get to the mansion, under the pleasure grounds and not be seen at all from anyone in the house. So you wouldn't see the gardeners going about their work. So would you like to have a look? I certainly would. Over the years, the Harper family had three tunnels built under the gardens. Just two are open to the public these days, although the third is currently being excavated by the Trust. And all you'd have is a candle to light your way. If that. You might not have even had anything to light your way, just the light at the end of the tunnel. And you do find things in the tunnel. You yep. brought some to show me. Yeah, we found a few bits and bobs. So we found a lovely um, old bottle of beer from Burton-on-Trent, which is, you know, fairly local to here. So you can imagine the gardeners having a, perhaps a tipple after work. And, of course, a gardener's friend, got an old sort of <laughs> kettle, so you could have your brew for oh, your tea break. I bet that made quite a few, didn't it, in its time? <laughs> it does look like it. I want to know what life was like for the servants indoors, so I'm meeting the National Trust's John Parkinson, who's going to fill me in on upstairs-downstairs relations here. It's, uh, it's a wonderful space, isn't it? It really, this really is going back in time. So you would have had the cook in here? Who yeah. else would have worked in here? There would have been the scullery maids, the kitchen maids, the cook. The cook, actually, we think, lived up, up the staircase there. There was a little bedroom just living over the job. Uh, right, OK. So this is very much her domain. Yeah, very much so. It was very much a segregated society in the house. You know, the, uh, the ladies and the gentlemen were all kept very separate. Once people were able to find jobs in factories and things, that was seen as being a wonderful life compared to being a servant. Whereas when you worked in the house, it was uh, almost like 24 hours a day on call. Unlike the more easygoing residents of Erthig, the masters and mistresses of most grand houses would have had little tolerance for below-stairs romance. But if your work took you above stairs here at Colk Abbey, you could lose your job for far less than a stolen kiss with a workmate. Well, what a contrast. In the 1920s, the last baronet of Colk, Savonsi, was a recluse obsessed with taxidermy, a hobby that kept the staff constantly on their toes. The servants' role in all this was really to maintain the even temperature with the fires, and the servants were really under strict orders about the amount of heat to, that was output from the fires. Quite often, um, they were reprimanded by Savonsi if it got too hot in a room, for example. How do you do that, though? How are you able to keep a fire at an even temperature? There is record, actually, of the footman. He, he, he talks about Savonsi telling him to take a coal off or add a coal to a fire. And presumably, he'd be really worried for his job if he didn't get it right. There is a story that uh, Savonsi dismissed servants, you know, if they got it wrong. But because he really didn't know them, you know, he just didn't visually recognise them as such. Um, they were re-employed at the back door, as it were, and they just came straight back in again. <laughs> so he wouldn't know at all that it was the same person? No. <laughs> Whether the eccentric Savonsi was cruel or just a bit kooky, you've got to pity the poor servant who had to dust his taxidermy. Oh. 
I'm at Irvig, a grand country house near Wrexham in North Wales. The astonishing thing is it is frozen in time. It is unchanged. The York family lived here for 240 years, and in that time, they were unusually cosy with their servants. Are they the family of the house, then, or are they more servants that, that's in the window? The, that's the family. The York's free and easy attitude makes me quite fancy being an Irvig gardener back then. But I'm doing the next best thing by meeting current head ranger James Stein. He's promised to show me an intriguing liquid curiosity in a hidden corner of the estate. I can hear this water, but I can't actually see it. The gushing sound is made by a peculiar circular cascade known as the cup and saucer. Oh! Now I see there the cup is. and saucer, but the cup's underneath the saucer. Yes. Is it one yes. on top of the other? Yeah. So why is it here? Is it useful as well as being ornamental? One function, as you said, is to be ornamental, but the second function um, is to stop erosion of the, of the river Blackbrook here um, by doing that very effectively, by dropping the water level very quickly. The river Blackbrook runs for two miles through the estate. Left to its own devices, there's a constant danger that it will break its banks and flood surrounding land. But that threat's avoided by sending the water hurtling down through the cup and saucer cascade. So who designed it? Willie Means, back in 1774. Gosh, so it goes where? Where's it going? It drops down about 10 foot yeah. and it ends up here. Mm. Oh, you can tell how far it's gone down there, right down there. Yeah, it there. goes a long way down. Not much in it at the moment, though. Not at the moment, no. Um, but you should see it when it's in flood. Yeah. It's certainly a different picture then, yeah. It's like a giant plug hole. Swirling and going It down. is, yeah, it's quite frightening, really. Yeah. But, uh, but as of today, there's not much in it. Do you fancy going in? What, underneath? Yeah. Yeah, go on then. Go for it. Right. Quirky but useful, this feat of engineering has undoubtedly stopped catastrophic flooding on the estate over the last 250 years or so. Oh, that's that's what it looks like from down wow. here. Wow! Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Curtain of water. It is curtain of water, yeah. Visitors to Erthig can view the cascade from above, but hardly anyone gets to go underneath. This is a really special treat. It's like the lost world. Whoa! Oh. Cool. <laughs> what? That's good, isn't it? Yeah. It's like through the looking glass. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Oh, there's a peculiar sensation when you look at it. I think you're flying. It is. You do. It's quite a unique place to be, to be honest. But it's certainly something that you don't ever get to do on a normal day's work coming in here. Astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. I'm so glad I saw this. Great stuff. An amazing feeling. But I really can't stay. OK. Mm. I'll let you go first. This definitely puts your average garden pond in the shade. But William Eames, the landscape gardener who designed the cup and saucer, didn't just make peculiar but practical water features. The gentry loved him, and he spent decades sprucing up the grounds of their grand houses in England, and especially here in Wales. Nigel Havers is an hour south of Erthig at Powys Castle, discovering how Eames influenced the beautiful gardens there. The impressive 13th century castle behind me is Powys Castle. It's unusual because it was built by a Welsh prince rather than an English lord. Inside, it's crammed with all kinds of treasures, but that's not why I'm here. I've come for the world-famous gardens. They first sprang to life in the 17th century, when architect William Wynde built formal terraces and grassy slopes. In the 1770s, William Eames made his mark by planting a ridge of trees known as the Wilderness. Today, the gardens of Powys are amongst the most incredible in the country. I'm meeting head gardener David Swanton to get to the root of just what makes them so special. Here you've got a Baroque terrace garden, We've got the landscape part from the 1800s around us and then a 20th century formal garden. Yeah. And all to be side by side together is pretty unique, to be honest. In the early 1900s, Violet, the wife of the fourth Earl of Powys, was determined to make Powys grounds the most beautiful in England and Wales. She had them lovingly restored, leaving this rare example of Baroque gardens in the UK. I must say, I think this is the most beautiful formal garden I've ever seen. 
In the 17th century, the hedges here would have been sculpted into smooth conical shapes. But when William Eames was about in the 18th century, they were left to grow out. Then, when the Victorians returned to formal hedge trimming, the trees were cut back and shoots grew, giving them the cloud shapes they have today. These sort of living sculptures, they're so huge on the landscape, such a foil for the garden, so uh, they're super. I mean, how on earth do you cut these? Do you go up a ladder? We've got a picture on there, they're using big old wooden ladders. Wow. Nowadays, we fortunately got a cherry picker and we work safely from the basket from that. Even with 21st century technology, it still takes up to 10 weeks to give this lot a short back and sides. And having come all this way, I'd be rude not to lend a hand. So I'm joining gardener Dan in the cherry picker. Look at this, this is amazing. Now, Dan, we're quite high up, aren't we? Yeah. I just do think about those guys on ladders. They must have, yeah, it would yeah. have been fairly scary. Very scary. Is there a technique to this? Um, just like cutting your hedge at home, just yeah. a bit higher, really. Yeah. Yeah, practically just following the contours and just trying to cut off this year's growth. OK. Shall we give it a go? Yeah, give it a go. All right. Every year in late summer, the team here trims 15,000 square metres of hedge, with a cherry picker lifting them to heights of up to 14 metres. I'm getting into this. There you go. And the work goes on come rain or shine. A bit of kit there, isn't it? Wow. Who could believe this topiary trimming could be so intense? Next time I see my neighbour Alistair trimming his hedge, I'll make him a cup of tea. Maybe something stronger. The Yorks of Erzig were an unusual bunch. From as early as the 1700s, they had a well-deserved reputation for being decent to their servants. But after almost 200 happy years, the household was shaken to its core by a dramatic series of events that threatened to destroy that friendly relationship forever. In the early 20th century, Erthig was home to Philip York II and his wife, Louisa, who loved to entertain, but struggled to cope running a stately home and managing the finances. When Louisa discovered that the household accounts didn't add up, she accused the housekeeper, Ellen Penketh, of stealing. Penketh was arrested and charged with theft. Author Tessa Bowes has written a book about the scandal, and she's taking me behind the scenes at Erthig to discover how the drama unfolded. Here is this poor working class woman with no people supporting her out there. Um, ranged against the gentry. Mm. The jury was all male, it was middle class, you had to be a property owner to be on the jury back then. A terrifying ordeal for anyone, never mind the lowly housekeeper, but the York's rarely seen archive reveals that Penketh wasn't your average servant. The portraits downstairs of the other York housekeepers, uh, they're sort of hatchet-faced spinsters. And, um, and that's what they tended to look like. Housekeepers had to be fearsome and quite old on the whole to keep control of their servants. Ellen Penketh was young and she was beautiful. How do we know that? We know that because I found one photograph of her hidden away in this album. This is a family album put together by Louisa. Here she is on yeah, the, right back the, page. the back page. Mrs. Penketh, cook at Erthig from 1903 to 1907. She's a beauty, isn't she? Goodness. Mistress Louisa was known for being kind to the servants. After all, she supported Nanny Lucy and groomsman Ernest's romance. So it's doubly heartbreaking that while other staff portraits hang proudly downstairs, Ellen's photo is shoved away out of sight. How did you come upon the story? Well, we're very lucky because nothing was thrown away from Erthig. We have <laughs> Louisa's diaries. Oh, so this is Now, there are Lady 49 of, the of these in the archives, and this is when the bombshell explodes, the 9th of September, 1907. And the day before, she's giving a dinner party, she's punting on the lake, everything's wonderful, and then suddenly 
Here it is. Before the Yorks and their well-treated servants moved in, the estate was revamped by their uncle John Meller. His plans lay undisturbed for more than 200 years, until a chance discovery by the National Trust revealed the enormous scale of his ambitions. Angelica Bell is here to pick through the intriguing details. When the Trust was handed Airfig in 1973, it was in a truly dilapidated state. A four-year restoration project of the house and gardens got underway, during which they came across etchings of Airfig. Now, these historical plans showed lots of fruit trees in the grounds, which sparked the idea to incorporate an apple orchard in the garden. The plans are now almost 300 years old. Guiding me through them is the National Trust's Graham Clark. This is a, a plan from about 1740. This is John Mellor's house, a wealthy London lawyer who's come in and spent a hell of a lot of money. Um, you can see the ornamental apple, uh, very regular lines, very symmetrical. Yeah. Why was it so important to have fruit trees then? It was almost um, a show of extravagance that he can afford to grow apples, fruit in formal lines and use it at the meal table. Fast forward 250 years and it's gone into complete decline. It's just like a forest in the middle of the garden. So that was the issue that the National Trust faced in the 1970s. And here we are, moving in, doing some literally heavy lifting. It was definitely in the plans to bring back as good as we could, but the apple trees had to be there. Catching a glimpse of the Trust Zone restoration photos is a rare treat. And now that I've had a look at them, I can't wait to see the kind of apple trees that were once such status symbols here at Erfig. Gardener Helen Erdley is giving me a tour. So are there different varieties on every single tree here? How does uh, it work? Well, every row, each row is a different variety. We have 180 varieties, wow. which is quite amazing. What's the oldest one you've got here? Oh, the oldest one, I would say, is called Decchio. And that's a Roman apple, pretty old. Not nice to eat, but they would use it on their tables as decoration. We've got quite a few with funny names. Yes. Uh, like pig snout, dog's nose, uh, peas good non such. They are You've got loads. very inventive. They're not all edible. Some of them are cider ones. To make one gallon of cider, you need at least 20 pounds of apples. So we'll pick these and then um, we'll take them and do some pressing. Yeah. Apple pressing is the first stage in cider making and Helen's giving me a crash course using a replica of a traditional press. There we go. Brilliant. This is actually quite therapeutic. Oh, not quite so much. <laughs> <laughs> a splattered apple. Keep going, Angelica. It's coming. Keep going. You've really got to love cider to go through this. Ooh, here it comes. It coming? But look at the colour, isn't that lovely? It's beautiful, it is. Yeah. Amber nectar. But all that hard work, for just that little bit, I think we should right. just stick to the bottled stuff. I think you're right. I think we've got some. For over 25 years, a local brewer has been using slightly more sophisticated methods to produce up to 750 litres of Airfig's very own cider every year. So let's say cheers to all those gardeners who harvested those apples. Cheers. Cheers. The Yorks of Erzig were a rare breed. Kind and respectful towards their staff, they ruled over a happy household for almost 200 years. Normally, servants were there to be not seen or heard. Mm. Uh, but here, it's very, very different. But it all came crashing down in 1907, when an enormous sum of money went missing. This is when the bombshell explodes. Author Tessa Bowes and I are leafing through private, rarely seen diaries written by the mistress of the house, Louisa York. And there was little doubt in her mind about where the cash had gone. Mrs Penketh, who has been cook here for five years, is a regular professional thief. She's stolen and robbed goods and money to the amount of £500. Right. There it is. Gosh. And it kind of gets worse. She gets really vindictive and angry as, as the, the days roll by. 
500 pounds back then is almost 30,000 pounds in today's money, a hefty sum, even for the wealthy, but a life-changing windfall for a lowly servant like Ellen Penkev. Did she look as though she was using it elsewhere? Did her dresses become more beautiful? Did she have a carriage and pair waiting outside? Not at all. Um, when she was discovered and turfed out of Erdig, she was destitute. She didn't have a penny to her name. So the money went missing. What happened to it? It's not a, a straightforward story. She was trying to cook the books a bit because the Yorks loved entertaining. So they're being extravagant, but yes. they're telling her she's spending too much. Exactly. Right. She was going to her trusted suppliers and saying, can we just say that this month we spent 20 pounds on meat and instead of the 30 that perhaps they had spent. And she said, I'll make it up next month. And this just got out of hand. So in other words, the family could actually have been living beyond their means. And she was trying to cover up that fact. And it came to haunt her. When Penketh eventually went on trial, things took an unexpected turn. The housekeeper was painted not as a lawless thief, but as an undervalued servant. She earned £45 a year. Now, for the time, that wasn't a great salary. She might expect to be earning £60, £65 doing that job. So did her counsel point this out in the court case, that she didn't earn much money anyway, they were a mean family? Oh, yes. He was really contrasting this pathetic salary with this extravagant life that her master and mistress lived. Nine times out of ten, the servant would have been locked up and life in the house would have returned to normal. But in a shocking twist, the jury found housekeeper Ellen Penketh not guilty. So how unusual was it for a servant to win a case? I think very unusual indeed. The jury was all male, it was middle class, you had to be a property owner to be on the jury back then. And you would have thought that they would have gone for their own kind. So she's found to be innocent yes. by the jury. Is that the end of her career, It's about the fact she's won the case? That is the end of her career. She's gone down in history. Even today, she's the thief cook of Erdig. Their servant walking free was alarming enough for the Yorks, but their troubles didn't stop there. Massive press coverage of the trial left everyone's reputation in tatters. Tuesday's proceedings, yards and yards of it. Yeah, it's a verbatim <laughs> description of what happened in court. This must have done the family as much, if not more, harm than it did Ellen Penketh. Yes, they probably really regretted taking this to court. Dirty linen. Absolutely dirty linen there. Overdraft, Louise's spending habits, how much she paid to have her portrait painted, how much the baby's new bonnet cost, it's all in there. So this is a black mark on the family, isn't it? Absolutely. How do they get over it? Well, they start to treat their servants a little bit more carefully. The wages go up, and Philip York, he started doing this PR exercise between him and the servants. He had to believe that, that, that they loved him and know that he was looking after them, so he wrote the poems that we see in the corridor. So the poems, today. in effect, say, Absolutely. I do love you really. And you, after all this, yes. you wondered if they really believed it, don't you? That some of the York's poetry may have been partly driven by guilt is an eye-opener. I think the full truth behind the Penketh trial will never really come to light. In any case, the saga was a painful blip in the otherwise friendly relationship between master and servant here. And it's that uncommon bond that makes the story of Erdig unique and fascinating. The relaxed attitude of the Yorks allowed the staff to have identities outside their roles in the house. And this saw romance blossom and the staff immortalised in portraits and photographs. The Yorks didn't always get it right. When faced with the Penketh scandal, protecting their own reputation came before compassion for their staff. But by the standards of their time, the family were pretty forward-thinking bosses. And by acknowledging their servants' existence and recognising their hard work, the staff of Erthig have lived on and have risen to become the most important aspect of the entire estate.